What makes a good melody? Well, I've challenged five composers to help me answer this question for you. Each composer has given me permission to analyze their music and to point out what makes their music melodic. If I'm able to find a good melody, I'll go over what characteristics make it melodic in nature. But before I do this challenge, I'm going to talk to you about why answering this question is not so straightforward. I've seen videos where people come up with all kinds of formulas or tricks on how to accomplish melody writing, and you can say perhaps that it has to do with changing up the rhythm. But then why is the rhythmically uninteresting Twinkle Twinkle Little Star so catchy? And what makes the Happy Birthday song, which has terribly uninteresting harmony, enjoyable to sing? Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! And what about Old MacDonald Had a Farm? Old MacDonald Had a Farm, E-I-E-I-O Nursery rhymes are notoriously melodic by nature and can be some of your greatest sources of inspiration. So while interesting rhythms can help make a melody pop, I'm going to refute this notion because it's not actually necessary. And interesting harmony isn't the answer either because all of my examples so far have stayed in key. So there's clearly more to this. Here's a pretty famous intro that I'm sure everyone knows. This is the intro to The Entertainer. This short intro has no harmony as it's driven by parallel octaves, which is frowned upon in music theory. So what actually makes this famous intro so catchy then? Well, I've attempted to recreate this intro using the same exact rhythms, but different notes. I stay in key and I use parallel octaves just like Scott. So if the theory that rhythm helps make melody is true, my version should be just as catchy, right? Let's find out. My version doesn't even come close to Scott's intro, but why is my version so uninteresting? Well, I'm going to attempt to answer this towards the end of the video, so make sure you stick around. And one more example. Here we have the world's four most famous notes that almost anyone can recognize. How are these four notes without any rhythmic variation whatsoever able to accomplish worldwide recognition. Without overanalyzing this symphony, it's actually built upon motifs, and the stitched together motifs are in fact the theme. And due to the way Beethoven cleverly stitched together these motifs to form a symphony, we all now recognize these four notes everywhere. So this is a psychological event, because if this symphony did not exist, these four notes wouldn't sound like anything. We are in fact anticipating the entire symphony when we hear these four notes. I'm going to give you another example of a motif in Camille's Piano Concerto later on in this video, and I'm going to briefly explain what a motif is, so make sure you stay put. So after all this, I'm sorry to say, the answer to what makes a good melody is not actually that obvious, and it's a little bit psychological. It has nothing to do with music theory, rhythms, or harmony. I'll still attempt to come up with a checklist of what makes a good melody throughout this video, and I'll give you my opinion at the conclusion. But in the meantime, Let's begin this challenge, and I'll pick out the melodies of each submission. Perhaps then we'll get closer to the answer of what it makes a good melody. Okay, the first submission is by Julian. The first thing that you're going to notice is that this piece doesn't venture out of key, and harmonically it's quite tame. I'm not sure there's a strong melody in this piece, but that's okay because not every piece of music has to have a melody. The form of this piece is ABAB, and both A and B have their own themes. So there are melodic sections, but this piece is more ambient than melodic. This may be a hybrid piece containing both ambient and melody, but if I had to pick out a melody, let's listen to the first 12 seconds of this intro. The first 12 seconds is the strongest part of this piece as it solidifies mood and it acts as a way to join section A to B. And the fact that this piece just ends abruptly makes me think that it's meant to be looped and this solidifies my theory that this piece is aimed at creating more of a general atmosphere. This next submission is from Zelds.
This piece is actually highly melodic in nature and is a form ABA. It starts off with a short intro, and this intro is also the ending of the piece. This is an incredibly rhythmic uh, piece of music. After the melody plays, we go into a section that's meant to portray mood. And I believe this is music that's meant for a video game. So being atmospheric is quite important. Like I said before, we don't always need a melody. The second repeat of the theme section of this piece is actually derivative. So it isn't technically a repeat, which makes it more interesting. And harmonically, the piece is simplistic and stays in key. You don't want complex harmonies when you're writing for a general audience. And this piece truly understands that. So let's take notes on this. We have a good melody, a very highly rhythmic melody. It stays in key and it also has a derivative repeat of the melody towards the end. Before I move on to the next submission, I try to make my videos engaging and interactive. So I may do more of this style of video to point out techniques. So if you want a chance for your music to be presented in one of my YouTube videos, please make sure you sign up for Young Composers today, where we are reviewing works daily. I'm going to put links to Young Composers in the description below. And don't forget to like this video and to subscribe to my channel, because Music Jotter not only sponsors music from Young Composers, but it offers a new perspective on music composition, and I ultimately need your support to get this product on the shelf. The third submission is from Expert21. The melody here is actually easy to pick out, as the entire piece relies on melody. The form is ABA, and it's somewhat harmonically adventurous compared to the others so far. The melody repeats two times each in the first section, and then it ventures into the major scale with a completely different melody. This piece here shows you that you don't need complex rhythms to create a good melody. And good harmony can actually help, such as in the case here, where the A section smoothly modulates to the B section. What we have here is a simple composition However, the composer puts extreme emphasis on melody. It's a good melody, it's great, catchy, and it's something that you can sing or dance to. So let's take notes here. We have a piece that relies only on melody. There are no derivatives here, and we have good harmony and some key changing. This next piece by Henry is actually heavily driven by rhythms, and it also has very strong harmony. So this small section here is the one melody in this piece. And the rest of this piece relies on keeping the rhythms consistent and using different harmonies in order to create derivatives of this melody throughout the entire piece.
and this section right here changes up the rhythm but uses the same melody as the bass line. does this in order to retain the listener's interest. This piece so far is the most harmonious out of the bunch, but so far each composer has used a completely different strategy to create the mood that they wish to portray. So Henry also submitted this next wonderful piano composition, which he also plays. And we actually have two melodies here. In fact, the piece starts off with quite a strong melody, and about a minute in this is where we have our secondary mel melody. And about a minute in, this is where we have our secondary melody. And what's unusual here is that the secondary melody is the winner as this is a very strong melody. But why is it so strong? I don't know how to put it into words as it's a little bit hard to explain. It just hits the right boxes. It could be the combination of rhythmic variation, dynamic expression, and the harmonies that accompany it just flow nicely. It's also something that just stands out and sings to you. For example, you can hum to it, you can sing to it, it's memorable, and it has an identity. The ending of this piece actually revisits the melody, and I think that this was a good move on Henry's part due to the fact that this melody is the stronger and more dominant of the two, even though it's a secondary melody. I do want to point out that there is more to music than melody alone, and this entire composition and performance is fantastic. Music is not about a specific melody or harmony, but it's about the entire story that's being told. And if the entire story is memorable, then this will solidify certain melodies into our brains. So are we maybe getting somewhere with what makes a strong melody? I'm still not sure yet, so let's keep going. 
And the final submission for this video is by Camille. This is the most complex piece out of this group, just due to the nature of the style of the piece of music as a piano concerto. It's about 35 minutes long, and I've listened to it about three or four times in order to analyze this properly for this video. So I can't play the full 35 minutes, but if you want to listen to this piece, uh, I'll put links in the description. And by the way, you should listen to, to this on your own because Camille really knows what he's doing, and I have to commend him for writing music that is unique and highly melodic in nature. And I will point out the parts of what makes this composition viable when you compare it to some of the greats of the past. So let's actually start with the intro of this composition. Now when we have larger compositions that require a great deal of listening time, it's really important that we don't give away our hand right away. And Camille does this as he starts off this work with a brief intro. But in fact, this intro is a foreshadow of the main theme. This is the foreshadow section right around here. And at this part right here, this is where we get into the actual melody. And let me tell you, this melody is very strong. I would put this melody at the Tchaikovsky level. It's just that distinguished. But what makes this melody so good? Let's go through it while it plays. The most important aspect here is that this is a melody that you can iterate over. And as you listen, you can hear how Camille is creating derivatives of the melody. The basic melody is always there, is present, but the minor variations are what keeps this composition alive and memorable. The second melody in this first movement presents itself as the slower, more romantic, and calmer melody of the two. And again, the structure of this melody gives the composer the ability to create variations around it, which is how you can expand on a composition beyond the melody itself. This section here, the slower secondary melody is presented again in a variation before we go back to the foreshadow of the first melody, which, which is right about here. This is the intro and we now transition back into the first melody, but it's now a variation rather than a repeat.
Are we getting closer to cracking the code on what makes good melodic writing? Does storytelling have something to do with how to write a good melody? Let's take a listen of the second movement of this piece, which is a highly melodic movement. I'll play about two minutes of this movement since the entire intro here is, is actually the melody. It's important to note that the dynamics and the beautiful harmony are incredibly important in making this specific melodic phrase stand out. But why is that? Because this melody is long, that's why. It's not like Beethoven's fifth, where he relied on short motifs. A shorter phrase is much easier to remember, but in this case we have a different type of melody. So in order to make this work, the usage of dynamics, harmony, and expression really help with this specific movement. About 25 minutes into the composition, we have the start of a new melody in the second movement. It's not as straightforward to pick out for an average listener, but it's actually quite strong if you know what to listen for. So if you listen closely here, you can hear a melody being presented in the treble of the piano. And this is the last movement of this piano concerto. And this beginning section contains a small intro then the melody starts right about here. This is that phrase right here that the composer will make variations upon throughout the rest of this movement. However, there's another melody about 28 minutes in that you're going to hear right about here. At about 30 minutes in, we hear something quite familiar. Is the composer bringing the melody of the first movement back into the mix? I think if you listen closely enough, you're going to hear a resemblance. In fact, a lot of composers of the Romantic era did this. Uh, Tchaikovsky was especially known for bringing back melodies of his first movement into later movements of his symphonies. Now, the reason why I was able to pick up on this was due to how strong Camille's melodic writing is. So a strong melody is like a fingerprint. A weak melody will just not have this identity. And just note that a weak melody doesn't mean a bad composition at all. A weak melody can be a deliberate tactic of the composer. And there are many instances where weak melodies have practical application. Again, it's my opinion that the intro to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony had no melody and relied on a series of short motifs to create a general theme. And now this is the perfect opportunity for me to actually show you the difference between a motif and a melody. So at about four minutes into Camille's piece, you'll notice the woodwinds making this phrase right here. And at about 28 minutes in, you're going to hear the same phrase. 
So I find this actually quite interesting because Camille is making use of motifs rather than melody. So again, just for reference, a motif is when a certain group of notes are presented throughout the piece. And finding these hidden gems in large works like this is what makes music appreciation so rewarding. And being able to pick up on these techniques and utilize them in your own compositions is what will help make you a better composer. So what makes a good melody? Well, what has this challenge told us exactly? Here are some observations I made around the pieces that we've heard today. We've heard good storytelling, and in some cases, strong rhythms. Certain pieces made use of excellent harmony to complement their longer melodies. As in Henry's case, some melodies were short, but relied on the use of strong rhythms and harmony to change things up. But Henry also had some extremely melodic phrases, especially in one of his piano solos. Some melodies were the full piece, and some were much looser and more atmospheric in nature. The melodies that are more atmospheric often have less predictable patterns, but they're more ambient in nature. And in the case of Camille's work, we've had a mix of strong melodies and variations to create sub-melodies. Camille also made use of motifs. The point here is that I don't think there's any clear formula. Each composer presented today used their own technique and creativity. And honestly, that's how it should be. If there was a formula for this, I think all music would just sound too formulaic. And formulaic sounding music becomes uninteresting after a while. Okay, so let's revisit my intro now. Remember when I said this? Here's a pretty famous intro that I'm sure everyone knows. What makes the original intro so catchy? So a few things here. Most of us already know what this piece is. So we are anticipating a very catchy and highly melodic ragtime piece, The Entertainer. This anticipation plays a huge factor. My intro is not tied to anything. So even though I kept the same rhythm, I didn't earn any recognition because there's just no story behind my version. However, there's already a well-known story around Scott Joplin's intro to The Entertainer. So this video is meant to show you that melodic writing is not as straightforward as you would think. There's a certain level of creativity that good composers will have, and it's not something that can be taught. Creativity actually comes with curiosity, and this curiosity will lead to critical listening of music. In fact, this entire exercise by me is exactly what you would need to do to practice if you want to write better melodies. Learning to understand music written by others is a huge step into becoming a better composer altogether. And the more music you listen to, the more you'll see what works and what doesn't work through the art of music appreciation. So the best advice that I can give you is to just sit down and listen. Really listen to what the music is trying to tell you. 